without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Kent Beck. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, he invented extreme programming and signed the original Agile Manifesto, and until recently was my colleague. Um, but <laughs> would you like to come up? Welcome, Kent Beck. Thank you very much. This is the, uh, can you hear me OK in the back? This is the uh, s second talk that I've given uh, post Facebook. And uh, I was there for, for seven years. So uh, if occasionally I say we and us, I don't really mean it. I'm not anymore. Um, it's uh, the last, the previous conference that I spoke at, I, I was the, the last talk of the conference, which is an interesting position. First, everybody wants to leave. But secondly, you can listen to all the conference talks and then summarize what everyone says very simply. So if you do a good job as the, uh, as the final speaker at a conference, uh, everyone thinks, why did I have to spend two days listening to all those other people? <laughs> the the leadoff spot is a very different dynamic. So. Uh, my goal today uh, is at the end of my talk for all of the speakers to rush back to the speaker's preparation area and have to change all of their slides. <laughs> so in any case, I, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I give a talk in the middle someplace, I'll just have to say some content or something. But uh, I'll get there. So I'm an old person. Um, I lived through the uh, the dot com. Who who here was uh, like a geek in the dot com era? Okay, so interesting times. Uh, sometime sit down with a, a granddad or grandma and, and ask them to tell you stories about it. Uh, things were quite strange. One of the experiences that I had was uh, working with a large contract. Uh, contracting firms and so this uh, group of firms grew up and they would you would come to them with your idea uh, we want to have a, an, uh, an auction site for used bagels and uh, they would take care of everything usedbagels.com they'd uh, register the site they'd bring in MBAs to talk about the business models uh, they'd have uh, user experience people design your uh, used bagel site um, and, you know, s sometimes when I just make up these examples, they actually turn out to be really good ideas. This one's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, and they'd have uh, uh, architects uh, would uh, design the, the uh, uh, usebagel.com site, and it was uh, very popular to, uh, to think carefully about scaling as part of this whole uh, pr preparation for launch process. Because of course, the last thing you would like to have happen is to roll out usebagels.com with a, a, a giant uh, advertisement in uh, I, you know, the Super Bowl is the American version. I don't know where you'd advertise here. And millions of people would instantly get on there desperate for used bagels, the site would crash and you would lose all of that momentum. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen. So let's design the site with all of the scaling built in up front so we just never have the problem that there are more customers than there are resources. Then you launch usedbagel.com and nobody shows up. There's a fatal flaw People actually want their bagels uh, fresh, <laughs> without teeth marks in them. <laughs> Who knew? But now we have to change everything except, whoops, we're out of money. And uh, yet another good idea would, uh, would fall apart. The people doing this scaling were engineers. They thought of what they were doing as engineering, and my argument for you today is that that kind of scaling is in fact not engineering. And I'll tell you what I think engineering for scaling uh, uh, actually 
uh, and actually means. And the, the first question is, scaling along which axis? As an engineer, the first question, if somebody says something about numbers, the first question you should ask is, what are the units? And this kind of scale for massive customer use up front is picking the wrong set of units. There's times for that, but it's, uh, it's not up front. So seven years ago, um, I, I had uh, two kids going into college at the same time, and I would have that for four years. And serendipitously, I had a call from a recruiter at Facebook. So that's, I was happy about that. I went and visited Facebook. The idea of a steady paycheck was, was wonderful to me at that time. I went and visited Facebook, and I found a really unusual engineering culture. Um, they, they weren't doing any of the things in my books. <laughs> exactly. And yet, everything seemed to be pretty much OK. There was a fair amount of chaos, but the site was up, usage was growing, new features were rolling out. Like, hmm, what's up with that? So I was drawn in not just by the steady paycheck, but also by this mystery of how is it that Facebook is able to get, in aggregate, outstanding engineering results without pairing with very little unit testing, uh, uh, with, without any particular kind of planning process that I could see, all the things that are kind of the, the hallmarks of extreme programming. Oh, and by the way, I didn't just sign the Agile Manifesto. I'm the first signatory of the Agile Manifesto <laughs> alphabetically. And that's why it says Beck et al. <laughs> to my eternal joy. OK. So I, I had this mystery. And um, boy, I, I'm a storyteller. And, and I, could, uh, I could go on and on about this. I'm going to give you the, the short version of this. Existential crisis. Had to forget everything I knew about software engineering because nobody was going to listen to me. And I had to relearn software engineering the Facebook way, from scratch. Uh, quick enough not to get fired. And that worked for seven years. So, not so bad. About two years ago, though, the, it's easy to look at Facebook's engineering as just kind of what we would, they would say, clown town. See, I told you I would say we. I'll get over it. It's like a PTSD thing. <laughs> uh, what they would say, is a clown town. It just, it's people seemingly doing random stuff. But while, while there was chaos, uh, there was also a rhythm to it. And I just couldn't grasp the overall pattern. And it took me literally five years before the picture finally snapped into focus. A little like one of these uh, 3D things, and it just looks like a mess, and then all of a sudden, the picture pops into focus. So two years ago, here's what I discovered. If you look at uh, an idea that takes off, the growth of that is uh, always some variation on the sigmoid curve, right? There's a slow growth at first, and then rapid growth, and then continuing growth. And uh, the sigmoid curve's generated by a tug of war between two feedback loops. There's a reinforcing loop on, on one side, which the more you grow, the easier it is to grow more. So this is the network effect. Uh, uh, this is something like, for example, with the J unit, uh, the more popular J unit was, the more people built it into their IDEs, which made it that much easier for it. It's just the default. Of course, you would have that. And it became that much harder for anything else to, uh, to get a foothold. So that's that kind of reinforcing loop on one side. 
So that's what powers the, the uh, uh, convex part of that curve. And then the concave part of that curve is, is there some kind of um, uh, dampening loop that the bigger you grow, the harder it is to grow bigger. So at Facebook, this is the unfortunate limitation that there are only seven billion people on the planet. <laughs> I did have a project, a little experimental project to, to uh, raise those limits. <laughs> which has nothing to do with my termination, but anyway. <laughs> you, you've got these two loops. You always have these two loops. I'm, this is very therapeutic for me. Thank you all so much. <laughs> I'm gonna feel so much better when this is over. You have these two loops, and the, the question is, can you, can you play that out? And one of the beauties of technology is once you get that reinforcing loop in place, it can go so much further, so much quicker than something that, say, relies on a physical infrastructure. Uh, because you can scale very quickly. The problem is finding a new one of those loops is really, really hard because there's a whole bunch of other people also looking for, for that reinforcing loop. You know, if you, if you just find uh, something where the, the more money you put into it, the harder it is to make money, like that's really easy to do. Um, Finding that one where the more money you put into it, the less money you have to put into it in order to grow, that's awesome and can take you very, very far. But if it was obvious, if that loop was obvious, somebody else would already be doing it. So the first part of that curve, if you want to create as much value as possible, the first part of that curve is per definition experimental. You're going to try a bunch of stuff uh, most of which you'll discover uh, uh, the results of the experiment will be, nope, this doesn't get people excited. That first part of the curve, the, what you're fighting against is indifference. Because there's everyone else in this audience is trying something else, and we're all trying to sell to each other, and there's just no way that this is going to work out. Like, everybody is not going to win this. So you try these experiments, and oftentimes the, the winning idea is, uh, comes out of either uh, desperation or alcohol. So uh, uh, the uh, chief architect at, uh, at Slack, Keith Adams, is, is my good friend and my landlord in San Francisco. Slack is a great example of uh, desperation. This company, they were building a game, they made this searchable IRC thing just to communicate. Game thing was about to die out of desperation. Uh, well, maybe we could start selling this, this communication. He has a really nice phrase, I don't remember what it is. Oh, uh, life sucking something, something, anyway. <laughs> no, he wouldn't, that's not his phrase, that's my phrase, anyway. I'm getting loose, this is good. Um, so, but that wasn't the original idea. They wanted to build a game. And the, probably that same day that they launched Slack as a communication medium, there were 10, 100 other communication mediums also being launched. But something about the particular twist they had on communication meant that the bigger Slack got, the easier it was for Slack to get bigger. And they had found one of those, and then once you find one, the rules of the game change. So you have this, this flat, experimental part of the curve, and it's, it's, it's actually not linear in time, because you, you try something, and you go back to zero, and you try something, and you go back to zero. And eventually, you try something, and it looks just like everything else that you've done to you, and that one takes off. When that happens, the rules of the game change completely. Not, not only the rule, you're, you're playing a completely different game. So I call this first part of the curve uh, exploration. So you explore, 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 and then, oh goody, uh, something took off. And now you're in the expansion part of the curve. 
and your behavior ought to change completely. Uh, now, as you're expanding, you discover uh, rate limiting resources. So, this being Cape Town 2018, I don't have to talk to you about there's a supply of some rate limiting resource, <laughs> and there's demand for that resource, and the two cross over, and then you give this day some really catchy name. As you're expanding, you discover, oh dear, here's the rate limiting resource. We just don't have enough bandwidth. And then, so the, the whole job in expansion is you take those two curves and you stop flushing toilets, which brings demand down, and you, uh, I don't know what you would do. Anyway, you expand the supply a little bit and the, you reduce the demand just enough to keep you from, from going out of business. That first part of the curve is uh, profitable, but it's a small chance of a large payoff. When you find one of these positive feedback loops and you're expanding vertically, you're in the only part of the curve where you have a high probability of a high payoff, but just because it's a high probability doesn't make it a sure thing. There are some very large companies that have grown quite large and never been able to cash in on their spectacular growth. So usually I say something snotty about Twitter now, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so here you are growing vertically, and you discover, oh dear, we're out of bandwidth. And uh, you do patch something together to get more bandwidth and you pry the curve of the supply and the demand curves apart just enough so that you, you don't have a, a death day or what? Is that? Oh, day zero. I like mine better. <laughs> For free. This is free. My gift to the cape. You're welcome. Then you get over that existential crisis only to discover that there's another existential crisis. We, we didn't even realize we were running out of hard disks, and now we can't buy hard disks fast enough. So this is another one of these. Now you have another death day, and you pry the supply and demand curves apart, and then there's another crisis, and another, and you don't have enough floor space, and then you, don't, you can't hire people fast enough, and then uh, you run out of electricity, and then Da -da -da -da. It's just kind of one damn thing after another marching up the scale. It's a little like the seven labors of Hercules, where Hercules wants to marry the princess, princess wants to marry Hercules, daddy says no, patriarchy, huh? <laughs> so Hercules has to do these seven impossible things. If he doesn't, if he fails at any of the tasks, no princess. And princess, no Hercules either. That's the non-patriarchal way of telling that story. I need to work on this part, obviously, okay. So that's what a expansion is. And it's, it's you, you, you don't have time to solve problems well. Uh, you don't need to be, um, uh, capital suddenly becomes cheap. This is like the B round in venture capital, where you have a proven growth model and the um, more money you shovel in, the more money's gonna come out, pretty much for sure. So uh, the, the game has changed, and you, let's say you get through all of those. At some point, the crises become predictable, and you can say, okay, you know, we need to keep growing hard disk space at this rate, and we can do that. Yeah, we have to keep doing it. We need to keep recruiting new customers at this rate, but yeah, we know how to do that. You can start to draw some graphs and make some projections. You can see what, uh, uh, what the future is gonna hold. And that's the extraction part. That's where you actually make the money out of the potential that you've discovered and then nurtured through this vertical growth, this expand phase. So it's explore, expand, extract. And um, that's 
my, my message to you today is that the units of scale change between those three phases. In the early days, what you want to be able to scale is the number of experiments that you can execute. The, the biggest unknown in the early days of any project is how are people going to behave when they have the project, the product in their hand. And the only way to find that out is to put the product in their hand. The quicker you can do that, the more experiments that you can run per unit time or per dollar, the better your chances of success and the more value that you create. Um, so the early days, it, the, the question is how, how can you scale the number of experiments? Now, this looks like cowboy coding. This looks like you're cutting corners. This looks like uh, you know, all those things that uh, uh, proper engineers should sneer at. And I submit that this, though, that cutting those corners is exactly proper engineering. Engineering is ab about dealing with trade-offs and dealing with uh, fixed constraints. So if you have this fixed constraint, like the money's going to run out on this day, and we want to run as many experiments as possible, the engineering response to that is to figure out how to run more experiments. Good news, you're going to throw most of the uh, experiments away if you do it right. You're going to discard this code. That, that last experiment that turns out, holy cow, people actually want this thing, just as you're prepared to despair, that one's going to live for a while. And you're going to moan and complain about how you wished you'd done everything right from the beginning because it's so hard to scale something that's garbage. If you had carefully done everything right from the beginning, you wouldn't have executed enough experiments to have the problem that you need to scale it and whine about it. That's what success looks like. It's not tidy, it's messy, but the, the units, in the early days is, uh, is about uh, the volume of experimentation. Now, I would like, I would like to think that there's more thought behind it than, than just a rolls of the dice. But honestly, uh, uh, j uh, just a, uh, modeling the exploration phase as dice rolls is not, to a first approximation, is actually correct. If I look at the, the kind of explorations that I run uh, frequently, like my Twitter feed, for example, I think of something, I just put it out there, as long as it meets some absolute minimum standard. But if, you're, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that standard's pretty low. <laughs> and the things that take off, you should have laughed louder at that, by the way. <laughs> the things that take off are always a surprise to me. So if the things that take off, there's a factor of 10 difference between engagement, between like the, my regular tweet and something that really blows up. If I can't predict my best strategy is to invest, uh, uh, if I have N resources to apply to it, I should invest one over N in, uh, in each tweet and just put stuff out there because I don't know which one's gonna take off. Now, if, when one takes off, that's the one to pile more resources on. If something doesn't take off, pushing harder on that is not gonna, not gonna make any difference. So that's, the, that's units one, which is simply the number of experiments. Now something takes off. Now we're in this expansion phase, and the units change. Now sheer volume is the units that we care about. We, uh, if, you, if you're growing really fast and it's a profitable, obviously profitable business model, capital is there to fund that kind of vertical growth. So you don't even have to worry about is this sustainable. All you have to worry about is what's the next death day that's staring me in the face? How am I going to pry apart the supply and the demand curves? If I have to throw money at it to do so, that's what I'm going to do because 
eventually I'm going to make so much that I can pay everybody off. So suddenly the, um, the units, though, change. If you don't notice that the units change, you're going to have a really hard time. If you're in experimentation mode, and this is where I live, I love that experimentation mode. If you're in that mode and, and that everybody's enjoying that and having a good time doing that and something starts to take off and you continue to experiment, then you're going to blow your opportunity. You have to change your mode of thinking. You have to change what you do as an engineer to this kind of uh, 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 scale at all costs for a while. But that doesn't last forever. Once you get sufficiently large, um, then efficiency starts to matter. So in the extract phase, you need to again change the units to a combination of profit and continued growth. The thing about extract is you can get to extract and still have 10x, 100x growth still in front of you. You can have a, a proven business model. You can be profitable and still be able to grow. This is one of the things I was able to observe at Facebook when I got there. There'd be one metric that everybody was staring at and everybody knew uh, uh, time to interaction for the website. And we were all at least peripherally working on the same single metric. Well, when you get to, and that makes sense, and expand because you know uh, uh, we couldn't get bytes onto somebody's browser fast enough. So what are we going to do to do that? That was the rate limiting uh, resource that we had. When you grow up, when you transition to the extract phase, the game gets more complicated. You're going to have multiple metrics. You're going to have to be able to continue to grow and uh, optimize at the same time. So a, a good example. Of, uh, of extraction, this kind of extraction thing was the uh, recent Dropbox, uh, uh, their filings for uh, their initial public offering where they talked about building uh, their own infrastructure. That was an optimization for them. Saved them a bunch of money, but the opportunity to save that money doesn't come until you hit a certain scale. So uh, how much time do I have? Are you my timekeeper? That's why I'm staring at you. <laughs> I have how many more? 20. OK. <laughs> so, this went a lot faster than I expected. Um, what? I can take 35. I, I, I just said I was like almost <laughs> done. <laughs> and then you gave me more time. So what I'm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've just laid on you a slightly more complicated picture of what scaling means. And uh, uh, I don't want to take up all of the time with my prepared material. So I'm going to <laughs> encourage questions from the audience. <laughs> See, I, I told you I wanted a running clock. Anyway, yeah, yes. Well, okay, we'll get you a, we'll get you a. Is it always apparent seeing those moments where you're changing from expand, uh, experiment to expand to extract? How do you see those things coming? Okay, the, the transitions really are uh, part of the trickiness. The transition from explore to expand, in, uh, in my experience, and I've been through these curves a few times, um, the transition from explore to expand is really obvious. You, you, the tricky part is you don't get to pick when that happens. So uh, a typical mistake is explore, 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 uh, nothing's really taken off, but we're about out of money. Let's raise another round, and we'll start scaling up our success, which we haven't achieved yet. Because it's too embarrassing to go, oh, yeah, we tried a bunch of things in this space, and just nothing ever worked. So the, 
you know, this will happen to uh, hardware. You know, you'll, you'll try a bunch of prototypes. Nobody really cares about any of them, but you'll take the last one you did and make 10,000 units of it just in case, because who knows? <laughs> and it doesn't work, and it, yet, I mean, I do that too. The, the, how you know that you're ready to go from, from explore to expand is, is you get responses that are completely out of proportion to any other response you've gotten. So uh, JUnit was an example of, that, uh, of this for me uh, 20 years ago. Can you believe it? 20 years ago, Eric Yam and I got an, an airplane in Vienna and we were flying to uh, 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 Washington, D.C. And we wrote this program. Now, both of us had written hundreds of programs in our lives. And some of them were a little better and some of them were a little, you know, uh, some of them created more buzz and some of them created a little bit less, but okay. We landed, uh, we were going to uh, the Uppsala conference in Atlanta. We, we landed in Atlanta. We thought what we'd written was pretty cool, but it was a little tiny thing, you know, or whatever, six classes and 20 methods. Like. So we handed it to Martin Fowler. And Martin was very encouraging, because Martin is very encouraging, um, which it's a useful thing. There's just not information value. There's a lot of emotional value in that response. The next day, we were both besieged by people demanding copies of JUnit. This had never happened to either of us before. That's explore to expand. Uh, it's unmistakable, and your market tells you when you've hit one of these. It's, it's, a, it's a tough, it is still a tough one because you want it to be happening so badly. Like you don't, you don't try ideas because you think they're stupid. Well, actually I do. Um, yeah, again, more laughter would be fine. <laughs> uh, like a test-driven development was a stupid idea, right? The, when I, the moment I thought of it, I went, that's dumb because why would you write the test before you have the code? Because you want the test to pass. So you're going to write the test when you're guaranteed that it's going to fail? That's just dumb. How hard would that be to try? <laughs> and it's that second part that's a really valuable one. Because if you make a habit of quickly trying stupid ideas, and one of them turns out not to be stupid, you don't have any competition. Nobody else is dumb enough to try these ideas. <laughs> And then you do it, and one of them's going to be much, much better. I mean, that's why I have the whole uh, uh, power law. I can talk about power law distributions. That's the nature of this reinforcing loop, is that most uh, powerful idea is going to be much, much more successful than anything else that you've done. So that's that transition. Now, the expand to extract transition is uh, trickier. Uh, partly, it's a question of um, either I could call it vision or I could call it obsession. So to use Facebook as an example, at one point, Facebook was the largest college social networking website in the world worth hundreds of millions of dollars, which sounded like a pretty good deal. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I mean Mark Zuckerberg fan, said, we're going to open up registrations to everybody. And everybody freaked out internally. Like, oh, no, that, we, you can't do that. I mean, we, they'd ridden this wave. They, they still had some growth left. But the, the, like, we won. Shut it down and, and start over. So that's uh, like, OK, it's time to extract. Because we have all these co college students. We can start selling stuff to them because college students have lots of money. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. And 
uh, it was a conscious decision not to extract at that moment, to say, no, we're still expanding. At Facebook, on the walls, there's all these annoying posters. I can say they're annoying now. <laughs> and one of them that really pissed me off was the journey is 1% complete. It, you, when you have 2 billion users, and there's only 7 billion people on the planet, <laughs> the engineer in me does not like that poster every time I'd walk by. I'd... So, um, where's I going with this? Oh, transitions. So, uh, how, how do you see this? You can, you can choose, so oftentimes a professional CEO comes in. That's the moment that the decision has been uh, made to go to extraction. Because the, the professional CEO's incentives are all aligned with getting everybody who has equity cash. If, if you screw it up at that point, you're never going to get another chance at being a professional CEO. So actually, founders are more likely to delay the transition to extraction. And if you want to win big, that's what you have to do. You have to leave the money on the table and roll the dice again. But it's all, you know, life's full of trade-offs. This is the trade-off gang sign, did you know? <laughs> anyway, now you know. So that transition to extraction, it's more a matter of choice. So Zuck said, no, we're opening up uh, uh, registrations to old people like us. And um, well, like me. Fair enough. And uh, turned out that he was right, that it was not time to extract, that expansion was still possible. And then I got there in 2011, and Zuck said, we are a mobile first company. Again, we had the world's largest social networking website worth billions of dollars, and now we're a mobile first company. When he said we're a mobile first company, just to be clear, we were not a mobile first company. But the, the, uh, the leadership statement was, if you are not doing something that's absolutely critical to keeping the website up and running, do something about mobile. I'm not going to tell you what, do something about mobile. And it's about 2,000 employees and the whole company turned on a dime and it turned out, you know, it looked like, to some people, it looked like we were way up here. But in fact, we're, you know, shrink that down. We kind of, you know, it's a bumpy curve. And we were still ready to grow. And once again, when the shift to mobile happened, again, it was ready for a very rapid and, and substantial growth. So that explore, the expand to extract one is more of a business choice. And I, I, can't, I can't fault anyone for, for making the decision to cash in. Like if I'd ever had a financial success in my life, the, and somebody said, I'll give you $10 million for it, I'd take it. It's, and if anyone here wants to test this empirically, <laughs> I will be here for the rest of the conference, and we can talk about what's on the other side of the transaction, but it's fine. So that's fine. Leaving the money on the table and rolling the dice again is fine. You can push that too far. So Uber's a great example of that right now. They, they want, they've deliberately stayed and expand. They've deliberately taken tens of billions of dollars of capital to stay in expansion. And everybody who put their money in is praying that they can make that transition from expand to extract. And it's not clear that they can. It's not clear that they can't. So that one's interesting. Tricky part about this 3x curve is once you do it once, once you go through the curve once with one product, then it gets complicated. Because now you have to have, and this is the, the lesson at Facebook for me, you have to have some projects in each phase at the same time. 
That means engineering has to understand that the criteria for success or proper engineering or adult behavior. Yeah, yeah, I just put air quotes around adult behavior. <laughs> changes depending on where you are in the curve. So having uh, somebody going around and pounding the drum and saying, well, we're going to have better engineering now when they really are talking about the extraction part of the curve is short-sighted. What that means is it's going to be much harder to run in a successful exploration. So th that next transition is the really tricky one, which is where you take some of the profit out of your successful extraction and people start having crazy ideas. And they say, what if we took the thing and we switched it with the other thing? And like, what, oftentimes the ideas are combinations. So what if we made a messaging system and instead of keeping all the messages forever and carefully indexing them and letting you search, what if we just threw all the messages away after 24 hours? <laughs> like who would want a product like that, Snapchat? Right? It's a crazy idea. Could have been done at Facebook, but it would, be, would have been really, really hard for, like organizationally for it to happen inside. That's that transition from extraction back to exploration. And if you want an organization that lasts, you have to be able to go through that curve once just to get the process going and then be able to run uh, some projects in each of those phases at the same time. It's always tricky, like uh, expansion oftentimes is a matter of uh, wizard-like technical powers. You, you, the rack switches have never caught fire before and all of a sudden rack switches are catching fire and you need somebody who just happens to know exactly, blah, 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 my uh, sister-in-law wrote the firmware, blah, blah, it's that kind of like, holy crap, you know about this, get in here. Now that person, that, that person is in extraction someplace. Their, their plans are on some roadmap. Uh, the thing that they were doing was gonna make the company money and somebody has to say, oh, no, go fix this rack switch problem. That's fine, that's what you need to do. And uh, it's difficult to create the incentives for a management structure to encourage that kind of behavior. That, that was so gently put. I am very proud of myself. <laughs> uh, anyway. So does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> so I remembered. I remembered that I was asking a question, uh, answering a question. All right. How much more? Three minutes? Now it's 20 minutes. Okay, cool. I'm just, oh, or we could go. It's beautiful out there. Like, this fabulous nature is a pretty decent alternative to me, so <laughs> when things peter out, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Why did I think I had 45 minutes? All right, so uh, there was a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so you talked about uh, the messy road to success of a project, but how can we scale that down to a single engineer, uh, maybe a small set of tasks? Ah. So the first thing for me is just awareness. That as an engineer, I need to understand that at different phases of a project, I need to have a, I, I need to reprogram my gut, my instincts, my aesthetic sensibilities. I need to, if you're an extract, writing more tests is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, careful refactoring is a, is a wonderful thing to do. You're making a, uh, you're taking a short-term hit for long-term benefits and there's gonna be a long-term. If you're writing thorough, careful tests in, a, in exploration, you're wasting resources. You, you want the answer, I want, okay, here's this crazy idea, I wanna put it in somebody's hands and measure how they behave, how quickly can I do that? Uh, so, like, the, there's arguments about estimates versus no estimates. 
to me, comes down to where are you in the curve? If you're in extraction and you have tons of experience now and you have 100 people working on the product and you've been working on it for three years and you don't estimate your tasks, you're wasting resources. But if you're in exploration, this is the first time you've ever built anything like this, and you're carefully estimating your tasks, you're wasting resources. So the first thing I want to do as an individual is just recognize, hey, uh, there's not one game here. Sometimes I'm playing football, real football, not the American one. <laughs> sometimes I'm playing rugby. Sometimes I'm, I'm playing uh, uh, American football. And like, the rules are different, and the strategy is different, and sometimes the people are even different. As an individual, it can be hard to switch gears like that. Um, the good news is, if you're successful, if you find that thing to expand, then it's attractive for other people to bring their resources to it. Um, and you don't have to be alone in expansion, necessarily. So we wrote the first parts of JUnit, we built something that was useful and functional, but how good JUnit is today, 20 years later, uh, had very little to do the, with our efforts initially, except that we found that reinforcing loop. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, we got one here. A uh, quick one. What's the story behind the shirt? Glad you asked. <laughs> so I, uh, I lived, I told you I'm a storyteller, so you're going to get a story. And you asked for one too. So hey, it's working out. I, I would have given you a story anyway, even if you hadn't asked for one. So uh, I, uh, I'm not supposed to talk about your personal life. So uh, uh, I'd just become single again and uh, moved to New York City. And I'm sitting there uh, at a donut. Do you have donuts in South Africa? OK. <laughs> when, when, when did donut shops open up in South Africa? Like 6 AM, 4 AM, right? No? 9, 8? That's not, that's not civilized. <laughs> so where I come from, donuts are like you consume donuts, coffee, and guilt in equal proportions at 4 AM. That's <laughs> so anyway, I was at this hipster donut place that didn't open until 9. I was trying to set up that joke, but it doesn't work if your donut place is <laughs> open at 9. Anyway, I'm sitting there um, eating my uh, lemon and sea salt. And it was really good. And uh, a guy walks in the door, and he just looked fabulous. He had a black pants with silver sparkles and big sunglasses and a, a, a thrift store jacket on that somehow just went perfectly. And um, he bought his donut, and he came and sat down next to me. And he starts saying, this is the best donut I have ever eaten. I said, oh, are you from around here? He said, no, no, just here for Fashion Week. I said, oh. I said, I just moved off of a goat farm, which sent the conversation in a long spiral. But eventually, I got back, as I'm doing now, to my <laughs> point. I said, I, I'm sorry about asking you a professional question on a, on a Sunday, but I have mostly farming clothes, and clearly, I need to upgrade my wardrobe. Can you give me some wardrobe advice? And he says, oh, absolutely. Every man should have a basic blue suit and a basic black suit and certainly get your shirts custom made and oh, just send you my book. So it turns out that the, g the random person sitting next to me is a fashion guru in, in, uh, in America uh, named Professor Courtney Hammonds. And he does look fabulous. Um, but he gave me the best single piece of advice I think I've ever gotten in my whole life, which was every morning you stand at your closet and you ask yourself, who am I today? 
And whatever speaks to you from your closet, that's what you put on. So some days I'm a jeans and a hoodie, and that's fine. And sometimes I'm a polka dot bow tie, and y'all can just deal with it. <laughs> so shopping becomes a matter of, I hated shopping. Hated, hated, hated shopping. Shopping's kind of cool now. I get to go, and I look, and I'm like, am I that? some days, and uh, everybody's answer can be completely different, but yeah, some days, this is just me. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Super. You're going to go out, you're like, I got fashion advice. <laughs> There's some scaling stuff, but I need shirts tailored. And, and honestly, tailored shirts are awesome. Go ahead. Hi there. Does the uh, flexibility that cloud environments um, provide us make it more, more sensible than before to uh, lay the foundations for the extraction phase during the experimental phase? Uh, uh, I didn't catch. So, uh, so does the cloud environment make it easier to yeah, the, um, like services like um, Amazon AWS um, allows you flexibility in your provisioning of, uh, you know, of, of your environment. Um, does that make it easier? And, you know, I, I'm not trying to countermand what you're saying, right? It's just okay. that you're speaking about that you're very experimental in the experimental phase and you can take care of um, avoiding death day when, when those things happen. But do cloud environments sort of lessen that pain if, if you up front, you, you know that you, you, you're planning for extraction, and can you, can you lay the foundations to make it easier for yourself later on? Yeah, yeah. great question. I, I think, and as an old person and having been through the cycles a numbers of times, uh, I've heard the story over and over like, just do a little bit more work up front and you won't have these problems eventually. And that's never been true. <laughs> Sorry. There are certainly cases where, so I do the trade-off thing all the time. Teach all my students. There's trade-offs. If you, if you just tell me, hey, more of this is better, I'm gonna say, yeah, but what's worse? because I guarantee something else is worse. Sometimes you really genuinely uh, escape the trade-off, where you're, you have better latency of your experiments, and it's still scalable. And if you can find one of those, super. But I'm, as an old person, always suspicious of that story, because it's so easy for it to creep into a little bit more work up front will save you a lot of time in the long run, well, uh, that's not my problem now. My problem now is nobody cares at all. So I need to generate something that somebody will care about before I care at all. Um, certainly, uh, it's, it's parts of scaling are much easier. If you can just provision a whole bunch more servers with the credit card, and you don't have to buy racks and you have a long lead time to order things from Sun, which used to be a computer company. <laughs> and uh, I'm still here, so. Um, th there, there are problems that used to happen that just don't happen today. That's absolutely true. But I, as an engineer, always want to be aware of this, this trade-off. And I always want to be suspicious of a little more up front will save you a bunch in the long run, which might not happen. Because that's a story that I've seen play out badly over and over again in my own projects and in projects of, of other people that I've, I've observed. Does that answer your question? If, if you have less work now and fewer problems in the long run, I'm all for that. of time a little bit.
Hi. Um, just so out of curiosity, um, talking about test-driven development, when you wrote JUnit, did you write your unit tests first? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then your next question is likely, well, how do you run them if you don't have a testing framework? <laughs> I'm going to let you figure that one out, because it is it is a lot of fun. It's like, it's a really interesting intellectual puzzle to figure out how you catch errors when an error means that you can't catch errors. So yeah. All of JN was written completely test first. We didn't write a single line of functional code unless there was a broken test case first. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, so, so what I was just doing was, well, what about what about three X? Like, uh, could we have could we have gotten that? in people's hands quicker if we hadn't written the tests. Yeah, probably. So, but it was just a lot of fun. While we were right, so we're flying from Vienna to Washington DC, Dulles International Airport. And Eric and I are getting excited about this and slapping each other high fives and making a little bit of noise. And there's this guy one row ahead of us on, we we're on the win, two window seats and this guy's on the, on the aisle seat, one row ahead of us, wearing kind of a brown suit, and he starts glancing back because we're making noise, and obviously a little bit grumpy, and we're like, ha, 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 we're programmers. <laughs> and um, then we get to Washington, D.C., and uh, Eric goes off to the uh, uh, aliens line, and I go into the, you know, bright color passport line. And right next to the, uh, the U.S. passport line, is uh, uh, the line for uh, uh, diplomats and, and federal employees. And this guy in the brown suit just walks right past me, opens up his coat, flashes a badge, and walks right through customs. And we thought, uh-oh. We just pissed off a federal agent for eight hours in an airplane. <laughs> Nothing ever came of it, though, so anyway. Two days, yeah, Ken will be here for two days, so he tells stories. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs>